ដោយអ្នកអាចមានអំណរដែលសិលឹងធម៌ដោយសោកអាន My name is Vandy Chum. It is spelled V-A-N-D-Y. Last name is spelled C-H-H-U-M. Okay. And Vandy, where were you born? I was born in um, Kawidang. It's a refugee camp off the Thailand and Cambodian border. Can you describe what you remember, some of the experiences you remember as a, as a young lady or child? Yes. Um, the kind of house we stayed in is made of bamboo and I think it's like coconut leaves as roofs, you know. Um, and the the bed we sleep on are made of bamboo, so it's there's no mattresses or anything like that. Um, Sometimes we just um, lay down probably cloth like sheets on the ground and we sleep directly on the ground that way. Growing up. Yeah, as a Cambodian girl, um, my father always drilled in us or instilled in us um, a lot of proverbs. I grew up with a lot of proverbs. He would, um, it, you know, to me, I, I fall in love with the Khmer language very young, very young. And I, I find it very fascinating. So I, from the, the very beginning, since I started learning, you know, since I know how to speak pretty much, um, I do not want that to go away. So I would listen to Cambodian music. I would watch dances. I would do anything just to make sure I do not lose my language or the culture. And and my dad's proverbs, it's like a poetry. So so I enjoy listening to it a lot. And um, a lot of it is a lot is teaching and guidance. So um, if if I'm about to walk in one direction, I I would you know, remind myself what my father told me, and and then I steer away from it. You know, it's kind of like a, a lecture in a way, but it's it's fun and beautiful. You know. Could you share uh, one of the proverbs? Maybe say it in your native language and then translate it, or, or could you do something like that? Um, I can try. I can try to remember um, some of the the things um, that you know my 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 the proverbs that my my dad um um shared with me. Um, a lot of it is associated with um, the kind of things parent would do for the, you know your child or or you know just everything is it happened for a reason and you have to make better of it um, one of the the thing um, he liked to to say to us one of the, the words that, um, proverbs he liked to say to us are um, I would say in Cambodian now it's um, and that was one of the things he, he would say to us, um, and it's what it's translated to is like, you know, there daughter or you know son or daughter um don't be sad you know what can you do now that you're born you know you have to make better of it a lot of things happen you know for a reason and what we need to do is to seek or to learn from um the the buddha teaching or the teaching um the guidance of um, the superior um and then when you finally found, find the truth, that is what, you know, your happiness is going to come out of, you know, if you know how to use it. Uh, when, she was, when she came to Stillwater, Oklahoma, she didn't know any English words at all. Even yes, I think she didn't, she had zero, zero words, English words. But kids pick up very quickly. So after six months, you know, the, her teacher told me that it would take about six months. 
And then it, it worked, it really was, you know, and after six months, she's mainly speaking in English, but I emphasize that speaking in Korean, speaking in Korean. So we can keep in you know, a Korean at home. Probably one of the best memories and, and what makes me who I am as far as being Guamanian um, is the fact that I grew up in a multi-generational family. And so I have aunts and uncles who remember me as a child and through adulthood and into marriage and now know my son. I have um, my mother's first cousins. I mean, when we say extended family, we're talking godparents. And, and when you're from Guam, it's almost like they know your family name and they know your parents and your grandparents and which branch of, of you know, this family you're from. And I guess from the standpoint of growing up, it was very important to us to have and be close to our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. Our culture is really shifting and changing and trying to adapt to the modern world. Um, and in all honesty, some of our traditions are being forgotten and left behind. Um, one is one most very important is um, the flute, um, playing of traditional flute. Um, I don't know the exact term, uh, but during um, like uh, funeral events, we'll have one person come and play a flute, a traditional flute, um, to show respect, and um, it's just a very cultural thing, and not everyone can learn it. It's very, very hard, and it takes years to learn, um, and not everyone is adopting that. And our language is also almost being forgotten. Many of the new generation now cannot speak our language. Um, they can understand it, but they can't um, kind of speak it and have a conversation with the elders. I'm really, really grateful um, for what I have today. Um, I want to tell all the newcomers, or even you know, locals or citizens, American citizens, as long as you're working hard, as you as long as you work hard, and as long you know you're honest and you know do good things, you're gonna be somewhere, and you you're gonna be successful one day. You know, keep doing whatever you're doing. You're gonna get it. Just stay in your path, and whatever people say, whatever you know they say to you, it doesn't matter. Just, just keep going, and nobody, you know, can um, knock you down or, because it's your decision. It's your your life. My name is Noor um, Ashikin Osman. And uh, since I married uh, my husband, I thought I'll carry his name. So it's Nor Ashkin Osman Lasso now. Um, it's uh, N O R. Um, my first name is actually Nor Ashkin, but I thought that Americans will have a tough time uh, pronouncing my name um, Ashkin. I'll just say to everybody, just call me Nor, but it's N O R space capital A S H I K I N. I was born in uh, Batu Pahat, um, Johor, Malaysia, and um, Batu Pahat is a coastal um, town of the peninsula of Malaysia. And um, if you know the geography of Malaysia, we have the peninsula and the two states of Sabah and Sarawak on the island of Borneo. We have um, 14 states, um, and so. Um, just like in America, people will be um, not protective, but a sense of patriotism towards their own state. Same thing in um, Malaysia. So um, the Johorians will be saying, oh, I'm from Johor, you know, and then the people from the north and say, oh, I'm a Kelantanese. So um, um, I'm born on the southern part of uh, Malaysia, the state of Johor. And it's not so far away from Singapore. It's about th three hours um, drive um, to Singapore. And Singapore actually used to be part of Malaysia, Malaya, before we had to give Singapore up to gain our independence from the British Empire. Can you tell us uh, what personal faith has meant for you uh, from you know, a very young age? What, how have you practiced your faith? Oh, that's interesting. Um, the Islamic revival didn't come until, I think it was 1983. 
Because I remember not a lot of Malaysian Muslims um, wearing the hijab or whatever. Um, yeah, and certainly not in my family. It was later on when I was sent to America that I found out that because of the way the Americans were looking at me, that I decided to take off my hijab. So slowly uh, from wearing the hijab, I wore a cap for a long time, sort of like slowly trying. At that time, then, actually, when my mom visited me a month after when I was in boarding school, she came and wore the hijab. So my, <laughs> me wearing the hijab sort of like had a trickle effect in my family because suddenly it was my mom, my aunt, and then everybody then started wearing the hijab. Um, but then after that, when I was in America, I took it off. So it shocked everybody. Um, but I said, you know, um, it, it, it's what um, I, I wanted to do. So you're from Thailand originally, yes. but you've been here in the United States for maybe 30 or 40 years now. Yes. Um, are there parts of your culture or traditions from Thailand that you've practiced here in the United States? For example, maybe language or certain holidays or festivals you celebrate? My language not too good, not improved, because we speak Thai out of my family. But so you raised your children and now your grandchildren grow up speaking Thai? My grandson, my grandson, my grandson, granddaughter, they speak English, they not speak Thai. Oh, they do not? Yeah. But they understand Thai. Because my wife, she not speak English. She speak Thai with them. They understand. Because I still want the children to carry on a lot of, some of the good uh, Chinese culture. Food, you know, kind of appreciate. Because by cooking, you really, you know, can sitting together to eat. You can hold the family together better. I think nowadays, because lifestyle is changing, nobody's sitting down eating together except holidays you know but i think you know if i'm doing that i think three children my older son cooked the most he does cook the cooking in the house okay my daughter doesn't cook okay usually come when she's still single she come home my younger son cooks a little bit so so by cooking you eat together you bring the family together i think that's important i know that my grandfather died during the korean war he actually disappeared and we don't, I don't, from what I hear, we don't know where his body is. We just have a memorial, like a, a grave for him, but we don't know what happened to him exactly. And I just know stories. Um, I, I don't know. Um, I, um, I remember this one thing that um, my dad would keep. It's a book of his writing, my grandfather's writing. And um, I think it was actually written Japanese. Um, and I was curious what this book contained, and I had a Japanese friend who, I showed it to her, and she said, um, it's just a journal entry, and it's just a repeat of this the day in his life, and yeah, that was, that made me feel very, um, I don't know, I, I, I'm very curious what had happened back then, and my parents, or my dad, uh, and other relatives talk about if my um, grandfather had been alive to raise my father. Maybe he could have been a great man, but now he's living basically an immigrant life, you know, struggling a little bit here and there. So, you know. I just want my family to know it's not easy for me to move here, but that's an adventure for me. And now I have the two children, and they are different from my brother, my father, I mean my brother's children, but they are good children. I just want my family to know, you know, they are not Thai, they are American, but they are good p children, good people. My name is Belinda Lam. I was born in Shanghai, mainland China, on June the 5th, 1945. Gee. Lang, born in Hong Kong, 1949. My name is Tiffany Lam Balcom. <clears throat> I was born in Greensboro, North Carolina on November 21st, 1980.
My name is David George Belfour. I was born in Melbourne, Australia, May 17th of 1981. How do you describe your cultural identity? What's important to you? And what's important for others to know that we might not realize? I remember in college, someone asked me if I was Chinese American with a hyphen or without a hyphen, and I was confused. And they said, if you were Chinese American without a hyphen, you were American as the noun, and the Chinese was the adjective describing it. Whereas if you're a Chinese American with a hyphen, you're about 50-50 both. And I would say that I'm 50-50 both. Um, you know, there are a lot of things about American culture, being independent and, you know, having the freedom of speech and to, you know, kind of accomplish what you want. And those are ideals that are you know, describe how I, I view life. And I don't think I realized how American I was until I lived in China for a few years. And there are certain limitations living in China in terms of what you can see on the internet and, you know, what you're allowed to say with a communist government. And um, I realized how American I was then. Having said that, my parents both raised me with a lot of Chinese customs and cultures, and there are definitely things that I identify with. Um, so I think I'm a pretty good mix of both Chinese and American. My parents have endured some hardships, you know, just to raise the family and make money and establish our lifestyle. Um, you know, that wasn't easy to do, and dealing with a second language and making sure that, you know, they could get past the language barrier. Um, and even just being able to say um, immigration and becoming a citizen was, was tough. What was it like to leave your family for your graduate school? Well, let's see. It's kind of hard. I think I cried. Even now, my voice. So, uh, I have never, actually, this is the first time I left my home town, my family, the whole family behind. So that was very hard. And then when I came here, and then everything is so expensive, so expensive, really shocked me. I said, I shouldn't leave. <laughs> yeah. Did you write lots of letters? Oh, yeah. And then, the, you know, I have to read everything in English. So it's pretty much, I just in the school, in the library, like seven days a week. Every day they just. And then I brought me a dictionary because the English, even I was majoring in the Western literature, but my dictionary, when I finished my graduate school, my dictionary just falling apart. Checking, checking, checking. Yeah. So that was kind of hard, but. I, well, I managed, I finished my grad school, so. My daughter and I talk about in the U.S. and Japan, Japan, and so we usually bow, and this is where I forget, usually don't bow, and so, but uh, you are, your country people hug, and, and, and family and friend, yeah, we, my daughter and I talk about the hug. That is more good for family and friend. We cannot hug, usually in Japan. And so, but more we can understand their feelings and dumb a word sometimes. That is good for, good, uh, good experience for us. Your culture is very fun for us. My family, um, my, especially my mom and dad, wanted a better future for us. Um, you know, we were not rich folks uh, with lots of money or, uh, you know, with lots of anything in Vietnam. Um, so the main reason that my mom and dad wanted to leave their country was for, uh, and sacrifice the, their um, being away from their family is for our future and our success. And I think that um, they have achieved that, you know, um, that their sacrifice has given us lots of opportunities. So did your mom and aunt primarily make 
Philippine Filipino dishes. This is like our our breakfast would be different. It would be like eggs, of course, but with fried rice and dried fish, dried fried fish, or uh, longanisa, which is a breakfast sausage they have in the Philippines. And uh, whenever I came here, the typical breakfast here would be like an omelet, maybe some fruit and a waffle. And I was like, this is different. I don't like I don't like this at all. <laughs> How does that make you feel that um, the younger generation doesn't show as much interest, um, if that's what you're suggesting? For me, you know, I know that uh, it doesn't mean that they're not paying attention, but they don't have what they don't have the way or they don't have a chance to show off. You know, some some of them they want to be a little, but but the old people maybe not give them the chance to, to, to show off something, you know, it's still like, like that, you know, not work good. But they, they still understand, they still want to, to do, but sometimes because of the outside uh, temple activity, let them uh, don't want to come close to the temple to do that. They want sometimes, but they, they say, oh, the, the, the one who work there, they maybe they don't want me to do like that, so that's why they, and then, like they come like today, you know, come on time when we, 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 set, we chanting for the dead body. Some of them can know how to do that, but they, they don't know how to chant. See, only the old people, they can know how to chant, and because that. My full name is uh, John, J-O-H-N, middle initial K, last name is K-I-M, Kim. And what does the middle initial K stand for? It's a K-Y-U, it's a Korean name, you know. Could you say that for us, pronounce it? Q. Thank you. And um, so, Mr. Kim, uh, where were you born? I was born in uh, southeast part of, no, I'm sorry, southwest part of uh, South Korea in uh, 1934. And uh, what... What is the name of that region or the closest it's a, town? The Chungnam province. That's where I was born. Do your do your children think of themselves as Korean Americans or just Americans? They think themselves as Americans. I don't want them to think as they are Korean American anything like that at all. Just uh, they are Americans. You know, they think like Americans. They talk like Americans. <laughs> Why don't you want them to think that like a Korean American? Why did you say that? Um, why did I say that? Why do you feel that way? Oh, I went through a lot when I was uh, all the days of a U.S. living uh, life. I went through a lot. I got discriminated a lot, but I always, you know, endure it, and then uh, I just ignore it, and then uh, I always walk away. So. Because of that reason, uh, I try to uh, teach my kids, you are just Americans, you know, but... So you didn't want them to have to face discrimination and, and other negative mm -hmm. things. Right. Um, do you see any drawbacks or negative sides about American culture or life? No. To influence no. your children? No. no. It's uh, once you became a, you know, the U.S. citizen and then live in an American style of life, you don't really, I don't really miss Korean, you know, I don't really miss, you know, anything else. I just enjoy what I have here and I enjoy friends and then, uh, you know, the companies and the community, so on. You know, my my neighbors are all Americans, and then I get along real well with them, and then uh, I play golf with them, you know. <laughs> yeah, I enjoy it, you know, just the uh, people. Um, but you have friends that are Korean as well. Yes, I do, yes. And how did, how did you make those friendships or acquaintances? Oh. Because the Koreans, they have a tendency to get to get, try to get together, and then um, of course, 
only days of uh, in North Carolina, we had we didn't have that many Koreans. Most Koreans at that time is uh, doctors and then uh, you know the educated people like PhDs and then uh, so on and then uh, so we get together and uh, have you know to, the families get together you know cook Korean foods and then enjoy each other so on and then go to beach together but uh, that's stopped as I get old. <laughs> How I would describe the gender roles, uh, you know, being immigrants, I think definitely adds an added pressure uh, to the family system, um, just in terms of, you know, financial uh, survival. And, and so more women were working outside of the household than I feel traditionally have been in Korea. Now, Times have changed since I was a young child, but I will say growing up, most of the moms I knew were working um, long hours, and that probably would not have been the same situation had we been in Korea. But as far as the family roles go, they're very traditional. Um, times have changed now, and so I think there is more of an emphasis on freedom um, in that role of being a wife and a mother. But traditionally, in my own household, for example, my mother did all of the, you know, kind of gender-defined duties for our family. Uh, and even to the extent that at mealtime, we always waited for my father to start eating first, and then we were allowed to begin eating ourselves. Um, when my father entered the room, we would need to sit up. Uh, we weren't allowed to lay down in front of him uh, just to show respect to him as head of the household. You go with the flow, you know, in other words, <clears throat> first three years in high, junior high school, you still have a Korean mentality, Korean way, Korean tradition, Korean customs. Then after junior high, when you go to senior high, it slowly changes. You part, you 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 part of America. You you Americans now. You know you don't have them. I don't know. I was still young, but you know, I cannot say. But it just changes. You, otherwise, you cannot survive. To survive, to fit in, you gotta be. You gotta be American. You got, you gotta become American. The temple. The temple was built for for my. You know, because my parents and every other parent wanted to have give their child experience to like something of home here in America, um, learning traditions, dancing, chanting, the way to uh, you know how to respect you know what you should do to respect elders, um, just the rules and tradition. They want to want us to know to infuse in us so we can know where we came from and not lose who we are. Um, now, um, you, uh, Sukjit, is helping with like traditional dancing and all that, and so she's trying to help also, like, and I'm trying to help also, but I'm behind the scenes type of guy. But now it's just the youth is I can see the change in the the generations, but they're still eager to learn. The kids are still eager to learn, and we're willing to teach them all we can but now it's just a fun it's it's just a place where you can go go and just like remind us of home what parts of your traditional um, heritage or culture or upbringing you continued or if how, how you approach raising your children here in the United States I think it's more of like a fusion of I mean they they grew up they were born here they're American and they we there's there's sort of intermingling of both Asian and, and, and North American culture. All our kids play sports. Um, they they eat both Western and, and Asian food. Um, yeah, I, I don't think that they have, I think they would say that their favorite cuisine is probably Asian, um, but not necessarily Taiwanese. They like Korean food. They like Vietnamese food. They like Japanese food. Um, so it's been a mixture 
uh, I think we're sort of right in the middle of the melting pot of America. My name is Manlin, spelled M-A-N-L-I-N. Maureen, M-A-U-R-E-E-N. She is spelled C-H-E-E. -E. Okay, and then could you also tell us uh, where you were born? I was born in Singapore in 1952. Okay, and was that in a small uh, city or town? or? Singapore is, an, is a city uh, state. It's an island, and uh, we Singaporeans have given it a little, uh, the nickname Little Red Dot because it, we are only a little red dot on any atlas that you see. I was having a lot of anxiety. The 9-11 thing had really bothered me. The war had really bothered me. Uh, I, I remembered the early years of my career when I had these uh, had to deal with the Vietnam veterans who were outcasts of society and couldn't even get their disability check because they didn't have a, an address. And I just could see that coming, even though the war had just started. And it just, it's, it's almost like, I know how Cassandra in uh, the uh, mythology, Greek mythology, felt when she could predict what was coming and nobody would believe her. And I go like, we're going to have all these veterans and nobody's going to care about them. They're not going to have services. And then by the time 2005 rolled around and we already invaded Iraq and they found no weapons of mass destruction, I was even more upset. And I said, this is for nothing. We destroyed, I always call Iraq where Eden was because of the rivers in Iraq. It was, it's mentioned in, as the rivers that surrounded the Garden of Eden. And I kept saying, we're bombing the Garden of Eden. And it just, it still bothers me today that we have destroyed a very, very ancient civilization that the first things that this country that I love, the first thing they did when they went to Iran was to secure the Ministry of Oil by, and not the museums or the hospitals. And I thought the museums and the hospitals and the more important things, not the Ministry of Oil, it's going to be there. And if it's not there, you can always discover the oil wells yourself. But you cannot replace the things that are from Sumeria and Mesopotamia and, you know, all these things now they're all scattered all over the world or destroyed. And it's, it's really a tragedy. I was so scared all the time. Um, scared for the country, scared for the people. Uh, wor I worried about what will happen to my children because I don't know whether the backlash will come. You know, if they can go after the Muslims, will they come after the Asians? And a lot of my friends just go like, oh, they'll never come for the Asians. And I don't believe it. I believe when the time comes, they will also say, we don't like Asians. At, you know, I saw it during the, uh, the period when the boat people were coming in. I saw how vicious people were about, why are we letting the, the, the um, Vietnamese come here? We, weren't they our enemies? And I also, it really upsets me now. It's so upsetting to see how they treat the Syrians, the re refugee population, and refugees have not caused, have not been terrorists. And I, I know that it's not, I can't promise you that not a single refugee would become a terrorist, but I remember seeing some somebody on TV it was one of the youngest inmates from at Guantanamo. He was arrested when he was 12, I think, and it had been 10 years, so he was already 22 or 23 years old when they were talking about releasing him. And I, when I saw him, he was a big grown man with a huge beard. And his eyes, he was so angry. And I thought, at 12 years old was when I got some of my foster children. 
that was so sweet and they may have had a miserable ride. But we have a saying, if you've been brainwashed once, you can be brainwashed again. Why didn't we do that? Are we not smart enough to do that? My siblings and I, when we first, I think when my parents first were starting off with a young family, my sister's six, eight years older than I am, my brother's six, um, they did take Tagalog lessons from the Philippine Cultural Center in Virginia Beach. But by the time they got to me, they were a little too busy and, you know, busy family. And so I didn't really learn that much other than the words that they would teach us at home here and there. But we didn't, you know, they always kind of kick themselves now that they didn't teach us language. Um, so it's unfortunate because I, now we live in a society where it's really cool to speak all these different languages, but they also were concerned with our accents going into school and being, you know, made fun of if we went to school with accents. Uh, now they call it Korean, they, uh, not the Korean language school anymore, Korean school. They call it Korean school, which makes sense because not only in language, but also Korean heritage and history. And uh, so uh, when they grow up, they will, uh, they will uh, not lose their Korean identity uh, instead of being uh, assimilated. Uh, they will uh, become acculturated. So uh, uh, our perspective of uh, uh, the uh, perspective of uh, Korean, young Korean Americans uh, in, uh, in the future, uh, she, uh, through uh, assimilation without, uh, no, through acculturation, acculturation without assimilation, uh, they can maintain their own identity uh, at the same time adapting and uh, merging with uh, uh, American culture, which has great, uh, uh, great things to learn. There are certain things that we do try to maintain, like traditionally like traditional culture in a family, like offering food for the family, like for your grandparents and stuff. Every New Year's, we always get together as a family. We make food and we offer and give thanks to our, you know, grandparents or our parents before the New Year's celebration start. That's one thing that we try to maintain traditionally in our family. I don't know about anyone else who does it or not, but the only hard thing is for just to let the younger generation see, oh, this is what you're supposed to do every year, but they just, they just doing it just because they see us do it. So that's why they're doing it, but they have no idea why or the reason why we do it. The other thing I also wanted to add to the previous conversation was that, uh, and I, I'm sure this is true of all Asian immigrants, but as you go down the different generations, the first, second, and third generation, you do see a melding of, of, uh, of shall I say, U.S. or American you know, customs within their own cultural background. And it's clearly, you know, and, and is it variable? Absolutely. Absolutely. But you clearly see this. And I even see this within my own children because I, I certainly think the two of us were brought up in a certain way that assimilated the Indian culture to a much higher degree. And to some extent, you're, you are a little bit sad to see that dissipate. Um, and, and uh, you know, but you, you try to do your best, but you are, it does actually break sadness when you don't see the strength of that, uh, of that Indian culture uh, within your own children, but you know it's going to happen. And I think certainly you could draw relations to, or uh, uh, similar thoughts to people that immigrated to the U.S. back in the 1700s and 1800s. My name's uh, Akir Saeed Khan. It's a A K I R S A E D S A E E D Khan K H A N, and I was born uh, right down the street at Moses Cone Hospital here in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina, in uh, 1978 on December 2nd. Is your home life different from your friends who aren't part of the 
Indian Pakistani community? If so, what are some of the things you'd like people to know? Or sure, why? just that you know um, our home life is very similar to most of everyone's home life. You know, it's about coming home and spending time with your family. Uh, these days, it's about doing grad school homework, grading papers for my class I teach, or finishing some emails up for work. This is a very common, typical American lifestyle. Um, you know, I think sometimes, often people assimilate the word Muslim or Islamic, and they think that we go home and do something completely different. But we pray, you know, we try to pray five, five times a day. It's very important for us for that. But our lifestyle is pretty traditional. It's pretty traditional American. You know, you watch uh, ESPN, Pardon the Interruption, and then you go into the CBS Evening News and, and so on and so on. So it's pretty standard. You know, maybe even Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy at night. Are there experiences that stand out for you? Sure based on your identities. Sure. Sometimes I, I think I'm like a Jason or a Jeff or a Michael. Like I don't consider myself like brown. I don't consider myself Pakistani because I was born here and I think I was also American. I think that, you know, sometimes after, it's almost like being in quantum leap or like, like, like Sam Beckett, like you leaped into this, this body and you got to remember that you're not, you're not, you know, that some people think you're not American or not that, but I really am American. And I don't, I don't treat myself anything but American. I went to the Trump rally last week, and people treated me very well. I didn't have any problem, and people were warning me, oh, don't go. And I said, look, I said, we're Americans. I said, even though I disagree with them, I'm going to hear them out because that's what we do as Americans. And so I think sometimes my cultural identity, people have a misconception about. But certain events that stick out in my mind, I think it's 9-11. I think that, you know, um, I was walking back from the business school, and I think there was a truck going by, and they had an American flag. And I, I think I heard someone yell out, you know, go back to your country. And that really, you know, bothered me because I was like, well, Greensboro is only an hour and a half away. Do you want me to go back to Greensboro? And then one time I was working for a, a technology company here in town. I, went to, I used to fix computers for a living. Um, and uh, when I went to fix a computer, this lady had told I, I wasn't doing, the, I guess, the job fast enough. The lady told me that, you know, I need to go back to my country. And that really bothered me because I said, what does that mean, go back to your country? I was like, this is my country. Uh, I was born in America. I'm American. And so I think things like that really have settled down with me because I don't want my daughter to go through that. I don't want her to go to school and someone says, you're not American because you have black hair. So I think that I'm trying to defend the next 100 generations of, of, of Muslims that live in America to show them that if you live in this country, you pay taxes, you follow the law, you are just American as, as John Smith, as Barack Obama, as John McCain, whoever it may be. So I think that I'm very passionate about making sure that every, every Muslim, you know, um, knows that they're American. Dang dang wang kan tu la unai unai in da yuning kan tu hm hm asasai anai 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 nai 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 da 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 that's all I know. <laughs>